So we didn't have individual goals effectively. I mean, in, as far as HR was concerned, we did. But effectively, what, what we had were team goals because it was like, if we didn't achieve these things, if we didn't deliver on the, if we didn't make progress to a, a satisfactory level, like building a data mart or delivering some dashboards or whatever the thing was my team was working on, then we failed. I don't care if you, you know, put all the data in there, but it never got to the customer. It, it doesn't matter, right? You could score 100 points in a game and still lose the game. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Ben Sullins. Ben spent his entire adult life trying to understand how the world works by looking at the stories buried in data. Ben's career in data started in 1998 at the telecom industry with the company MCI. Since then, Ben has consulted at Silicon Valley's biggest companies and led the charge at Pluralsight to become a data-driven organization and help millions elevate their skill sets. In 2016, Ben shifted gears towards helping fight climate change and leave a better world for future generations. Ben's efforts in that space involve helping people decide to drive electric vehicles, as well as living more sustainably with renewable energy solutions. Today, Ben continues to help people develop their skill sets at Free the Data Academy and inspires people to live more sustainably on YouTube. In our conversation today, we learn about Ben's incredible journey into data, why he thinks goal setting might be complete BS. I think you'll really enjoy our healthy debate on the topic. Ben, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I have I was just recently on your, your podcast, Free the Data, and I'm so happy to be able to have you on to tell your story, talk about your journey on YouTube, and also talk about some of the other fun projects that you're working on. So again, thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely, man. Happy to be here. Excellent. Well, so the first thing that I always like to start off with to get the listeners just a little bit more familiar with, with you and your story is understanding how you first got introduced to data. So did you become interested in data because of one pivotal moment or something that happened to you in the past, or has it been a slow progression over time? I mean, so I'm sort of a dinosaur, I guess, in this industry at this point. I mean, I, I have my first job where I was doing data things was in 1998. Um, I was 17 years old and I was just a techie kid. I built my own computer when I was 15. You know, this was before cable internet was a thing when you had like AOL di uh, CDs, you had to, to dial up and do the thing. I mean, so I was just always interested in technology and I got a job working at the help desk at a company called MCI, which at the time was the world's largest communications company. And then later massive scandal and bought by Verizon, whatever. So, but at the time, this was like the pinnacle of tech. And, and remember the internet was like, not really a thing. It was barely like, oh, the internet's cool. It was still like most grownups didn't know what it was or whatever. Um, and at that job at the help desk, I got to do everything. I got to, you know, tune phone systems. I got to replace vax terminals. I got to do tape backups on, on, uh, in the little data center we had and all these things. And one of the things we got to do was to work with what was then called the reporting team. And the reporting team basically were just doing things in Excel. It was at a call center in Phoenix, Arizona. And we had outbound and inbound calls coming in, outbound sales, inbound sales, customer service, that kind of stuff. And the reporting team always had to figure out how many sales did we make? And they'd print out reports, give them to people's uh, sales supervisors. Inbound people had to figure out how many you know staffing levels and things like that. And as I was just there on the help desk, I got to touch all of these different things. And I sort of just found myself working and helping the reporting team more and more do their work in Excel. And this was Office 97. So we're like Excel 97 and Microsoft Access were the tools we used primarily. And, you know, SQL Server, like I don't think was even a thing yet. Maybe SQL Server, it was, I think it was still Sybase. So, I mean, it was, it was very early days compared to like what we, the technology we have now. And yeah, I just gravitated towards doing it. It was like something I was better and better at, uh, or, you know, finding myself to growing in those skills. And then later they invited me to join their team. And then I got a job on the reporting team. And ever since then, I mean, like, like I said, 98, I just, I found it was interesting to me. I found that people valued it. And it was always growing and changing. So it wasn't boring, right? It was like, oh, there's something new. People are changing this. Let me try that. And, and back in those days, it was very much the Wild West. Like putting a chart on a web page would, would have been considered revolutionary at the time. Like just having a table of data on a web page meant that you had to write code 
at the time, I think like the first one I did was in classic ASP, like .NET wasn't even a thing yet. And having to like hack your way together, I just loved. And, and so I just really kind of grew an affinity for it at that early age, at that early uh, stage, even in, you know, what we would call data science maybe today. And I just stuck with it for my whole career because every turn that my career took and my life took, I had the ability to help people make better decisions using data. And that was always a valued thing, no matter where I lived or what, what the situation called for. So that was really like how it started. And then I just stuck with it for, I mean, almost 20 years, I think. Well, I love that so much. I mean, something you described is that you're not ever going to get bored within that domain because things were constantly changing. And I think it's really important that you had that mindset, right? If, if you're on the other side of that, where you're like, oh my goodness, things are changing so fast, I'm completely overwhelmed, probably wouldn't have had that much success in this career so far. Right. And I think that that's something that everyone can, can look at is that, hey, you know, the data domain, data science in, in particular, it is changing really fast. But that means that the potential for the things you can do is constantly growing and expanding. It means that if there are new avenues that you're looking to explore that you haven't yet, they're almost definitely open. They're, your people are going to advance in a lot of the different, uh, more uh, like specific or specialized areas within the domain. So, you know, in my, in my mind and in your mind, it, that's an incredibly good thing. That's an awesome thing. It means like, yeah. wow, there's so much out there that we still haven't done. But I see so many people that are sort of on the other side of that, where they're trapped, they have this overload of information. You know, mm. how, how have you dealt with that? Like, like, oh my goodness, there's so much stuff to, to learn. How do I know what to go into? You know, as yeah. you've progressed through your career, I mean, obviously you've done a lot, um, but how did you make those decisions to say, hey, I'm going to follow this uh, and like ignore a lot of the other cool stuff that's going on, all those shiny objects. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. that? process look well, like for you? I, I think for me, I was always very close to the business in my career. I was always working hand in hand with the people that were the, the on the business side, making the decisions, doing the thing that made the company go or organization go. And so being close to that, I always shared that that vision or, or, or that purpose of like, oh yeah, I do this because customer service is going to be handled better, which means you have better customers, which means the company does better. I always was able to tie what I did directly to some sort of business goal. And because of that, the, the tool sets and the different skills and how we approach things always were really just about delivering results. It was never academic in any way, right? Like I, I've just built so many, like they just hack together systems that worked beautifully and delivered amazing results. And as a result, I saw my career grow and progress and, you know, get promoted and all these things, not because I was the best coder in the world, but because I had the same belief and same focus as the people that I was serving. So I shared that, 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 that vision with them. And so, you know, at, at, you can't let like your, your something you learned in school or something you read online, get in the way of delivering. Because when you're not delivering stuff now, now in the business world, I'll say in academia, it's sure totally different, but in most people's jobs. So that focus on, on getting things done and helping people make better decisions always like bared fruit. And so people didn't care what I did as long as I delivered results. So I had the opportunity in a lot of companies where, you know, they just, they wouldn't even question how I was getting something done. So as I went through my career, I just always made sure that what I was doing, I could tie it back to something. And that might be hard for some folks that are maybe way more back end, like data engineering, data architecture, where you're setting up these servers and these systems and these pipelines, but you have no idea how that ties to a salesperson's job or a customer service person's job or whatever. Um, so for me, anyways, that was always my focus is like, how can I help these people get their job done quicker or better? Uh, because I know that that's going to make a real difference. And, and, in being in that position, I was always looked at, I think, uh, favorably from, from the people that made those decisions of like, you know, where do we spend our money? Who, you know, who do we hire? How do we, how do we grow this thing? Let's bring Ben in. Let's bring his team in. Let's make sure that, that they're a part of it because we know that they can help. Um, in data science specifically, and, you know, we'll use that term as sort of like the statisticians that can code. I think it can get a bit more muddy. Um, and, and that's where when I've led data science teams, I've always tried to try to instill that of like, why are we doing any of this? Sure, we can find some, you know, P value or R squared or K or whatever, 
But unless that translates to something that matters to the people that do to our organization, to our business, no one's going to care. And so trying to like focus on the core elements of like being, uh, you know, helping move the needle forward, it, it, it really just kind of made everything else simpler. Because if something didn't help me achieve that goal, then I wouldn't focus on it. I wouldn't do it. I like what you said there so much. I think that, you know, if we take away the beautiful stories that you had in there at the most basic level, what you were able to do is you had a, a fairly clear unifying goal uh, throughout your career. And all the things that you learned, all the things you hacked together were pointed at achieving that goal in a certain way. And when we talked about, you know, in my episode on the, on the free data pod, free, the data podcast, um, how, when I was pursuing playing golf, all I did, all my projects were to make me a better golfer, right? I was collecting this information. I was collecting this data and I learned some really cool skills all in the name of making me improve my golf scores. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, like, it doesn't matter if it's your work. It doesn't matter if it's your personal projects. It doesn't matter if it's your health and fitness. If there's something that's unifying it all together, you learn all those other things out of the initiative to improve or to, to take action on the goal. And then it doesn't be, become so overwhelming because it's all pointed to the same thing. I think that, you know, that concept was revolutionary to me. And it seems like you were able to identify pretty, pretty early in your career, especially mm -hmm. as it relates to business. I will say, I don't think in academia, it necessarily has to be that different. I mean, the goal could be pursuit of knowledge, right? And if, yeah. if your mindset is that, hey, like, I want to learn all this information, I want to understand it and digest it. It's probably not that intimidating to you because like, that's like what you're destined to be doing. That's what the goal is. It, it shouldn't be overwhelming if, if you're like refining it in that sense. Um, but again, I really like that. And I'm interested in how you leverage that to further your career. You know, you started working at this company in data at a fairly young age. How did it progress from you essentially like working for other people, trying to accomplish business objectives to eventually leading teams and yeah. I guess, addressing the business objectives at, at even greater scale? Yeah. So, so throughout most of my career, I was what you call an individual contributor, right? I was the person writing the code, making the charts, uh, you know, doing, doing the things that, that, that made uh, the sausage, so to speak. And so uh, as my career, as I got better and better at that, and I had more and more experience, eventually I got asked to like lead a team that did that thing. And it was actually a tough transition for me because it, it's one thing to write the code and, and, and make, the machine do what you want to. It's really different to take a step back and try to embrace and build a team of humans that will also kind of operate in the same way. I think this is maybe a big problem with a lot of management uh, people in management now is that they 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 went from being the best skilled person at a thing to no you should be a manager now, but they never took the time to learn how different management is to being an individual contributor. And so, so throughout, so, you know, I struggled with it at first, but my mindset is very all in on anything I do. And so, yeah, I like full on took a lot of, uh, courses at community colleges. I took a lot of, uh, like, like, like specialty training programs where I'd go to like an offsite for a weekend about being a manager and focusing on more of the like philosophical ways that, that working with humans is different than working with machines. And so, so that transition was initially really tough. But then once I got past that hump, it, it, it was, it was just, it was mind-blowingly simple. You know, it, it was as a manager of a group of data people or a group of any people, my job was to make people love their job so much that they would do their best work. And so I had to fine tune every single person, what they were focused on, how that was helping us as a business and make sure that, you know, an introvert didn't have to be giving presentations every week and an extrovert didn't have to go sit and think for three weeks on a project that they could be out there talking to people. And so management was such a different skill set. It was more like playing, you know, like, like conducting an orchestra than playing an individual instrument. Um, it was a career, you know, so it took me a while. I think I started in management, maybe like 2000, six or seven. That's what I kind of, when I made that transition from individual contributor. And then from there, you know, it just, because my teams were, were always, because I, all I cared about was their well being essentially. Like I would often like, you know, not lie, but kind of like BS all the other po uh, people above me about what we were doing or whatever, because trying to explain to them how 
I was setting goals, which I don't believe in at all, how I was like kind of like hacking their little systems that they want to play from the business book they read last week to make my team more productive. Like because of that, my teams were always super engaged and I ended up just growing and growing and growing, getting more people that wanted to work on my team, you know, and, and to the point where I ended up becoming the chief data officer for Pluralsight, which was the, or is a online education company where I had like, I don't know, three teams spread across the country, 30, 40 people, eventually things like that. And it was always that same mindset of just like, like these people are smarter than me. They're so much better than me. And, and I, I want that because all my job then can be to help them have their best job. I want every person that ever worked for me to go back and be like, Oh man. And whenever, you know, our relation, when we, our, our paths diverge, I want those people to be like, damn, I miss working for Ben because he got it, you know? So, so it was, it was a different, it was a very different skill set. but you know, my focus, whenever I dive into something is like really go hard on it. And so I feel like I was able to do that. Um, and it was pretty rewarding, you know, for until I left corporate America in 2016. So something I really like in there is that you're able to maximize the collective outcomes by focusing on the individual outcomes, by paying really close attention to your employees, by making sure they're getting what they want. And I feel like that's a pretty delicate song and dance, but that's also what the manager is supposed to be doing. You know, I've talked to people where, you know, their manager hands them a book and is like, ah, everyone's reading this. I think that this is relevant. To, this is going to make our company great. Yeah. And a one size fits all approach in my mind, is not how you can manage people effectively unless you've hired very specifically to have one type of person on your team, which usually doesn't create great outcomes, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's hard. So, it's hard to balance that. Something you, you mentioned is that, you know, you don't believe in like the goal setting process or whatever that might be. Can yeah. you expand on what that means uh, from an individual level and and like a team management level? Yeah, sure. Um, there, there's this big focus in... I don't know, our society and certainly in, in business of, of setting a goal and, and potentially setting goals that are way too hard to reach and that, you know, you'll shoot for the, uh, shoot for the stars, land on the moon kind of a thing. I think this is all just bogus. I, I, I think it's dumb. I, I think it's counterproductive um, because ultimately goal after you achieve a goal, what's next? Oh, another goal. Okay, great. And let me just add another goal. I believe in milestones. Hey, you hit a million subscribers on YouTube. Thumbs up. Let's have a party. I get that. I get the idea of celebrating certain milestones, but I believe in more of a direction and focusing on progress. And, and, and so here's the thing is, is goals. When we, when we have this like laser like focus in, in, in this big obsession with them, we often will sacrifice other things in, in, in pursuit of the goal. Uh, so if I have uh, a, a goal of making a million cars this year, I may say screw quality, screw customer service because I don't care. That's not my goal. And so when you set goals at an individual level, what you're automatically doing is saying to a person, hey, this is the number one thing that's important for, for uh, you to be focused on, which means instead of helping your teammate who's struggling, I want you to focus on you. It's almost like, imagine if Kobe Bryant, you know, when he was playing, the late, great Kobe Bryant was playing. And yes, he was a tremendous scorer, but he also helped his teammates. Or like Jordan, you know, Jordan was so great, not because he was the best scorer on the team, but because everyone else around him became better. And, and, and so if it was, hey, uh, Kobe, Michael, I want you to score as many points as possible. Chances are they would lose a lot of games, Right. So you have to, in my mind, kind of like focus on the, the, the team or as big as the team can be if you're the leader of a company, the entire company around uh, directions of things you want to do. Because when you have goals, you're, you're setting up people for failure. Setting, you're setting up things that either they're going to achieve the goal and then what's next? You have this sense of despair until the next goal is higher and bigger. And then eventually you get really fatigued with this notion of just like this hedonic treadmill, more, 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 better, better, better. Um, and if you do it at an individual level, you really are not helping the team get better. You're helping that individual get better. So as an example, what I would do, you know, the first management role I had, we had, we, I had to do this, like our company, big company, we had these like HR systems, I had to go put in goals or whatever. And so instead of like saying, okay, can you do this? And then Jeff over here, you do this. 
I set everybody's goals the exact same percentage for all the things. So we didn't have individual goals effectively. I mean, in, as far as HR was concerned, we did. But effectively, what, what we had were team goals because it was like, if we didn't achieve these things, if we didn't deliver on the, if we didn't make progress to a, a satisfactory level, like building a data mart or delivering some dashboards or whatever the thing was my team was working on, then we failed. I don't care if you you know put all the data in there, but it never got to the customer. It, it doesn't matter, right? You could score 100 points in a game and still lose the game. So what, what matters here, the team or the individual? And so to me, I always try to rearrange things to where everybody was interested in helping each other out. And in and, and that way, we can we can kind of grow together and get better together and not just, oh, this person is a superstar and this person sucks. I hate that. I think it's toxic and it creates uh, interpersonal kind of problems and it doesn't help the company overall either. So I, I really like that. And I agree with you. And I, I also like disagree with you a little bit. And I think that that's like a fun thing to sure. dive into. So the first thing in terms of a like major agreement, I think so many, especially large companies get into massive problems. And you actually talked about this in a, in a YouTube video recently, but it's something I see constantly is chasing quarterly profits over long-term growth and benefit, right? Effectively, when companies reach around 150 employees, the incentive structure starts to change where you see people when uh, their major motivation is to see company growth and at around that 100 in the early stages, like, hey, we're part of this really cool thing. We want to see it grow. What, what could be possible? Once you hit this certain magic number around 150 or 200, it starts to shift to individual incentives. How do I get promoted? How do I do this? How do I do yeah. that? And that is effectively toxic for a company unless you can figure out how to create really good systems and um, really good accountability structures to, to mitigate a lot of those. It's me me those versus skills, right? you. It's not exactly. us as a team versus the rest of the competition. It's me versus you. And that's just not the recipe for a good team or a good company. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of companies that have had really good long-term success, I think like historically Apple has done an incredible job at this, is that they measure success in larger chunks or they measure success in, I mean, obviously they have quarterly reports. They have these things that, that, that affect their uh, shareholders and whatever it is, but there isn't this feeling of urgency that they need to perform every quarter because they've created this atmosphere about, hey, we're waiting for the next big thing from them. And mm -hmm. it, you know we're going to see what's going to come out, right? I think a couple other companies have done that really well. But getting away from that like really short-term goal structure, 100%, I think is fundamentally wrong. Uh, well, I fundamentally not wrong, but inefficient or ineffective. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I will say I, like, I, I agree with you on sort of like the, the team goal setting. Um, but I think you can have success with individual goals but you have to be very, very meticulous with how you set them up. Like just what you described, I'd say 80, 90% of goals are counterproductive because yeah. they're framed in the wrong way. It's like, oh, I want this thing. Namely, let's say take the million YouTube subscribers or something. Like I want this thing, but I'm not gonna hit it, right? In X, Y, Z amount of time because I have very little control directly over my subscriber count. Like, yes, there mm -hmm. are things I can do, but the things that I do are loosely correlated and I don't have a whole lot of control over achieving that thing. On the other hand, I think if you're setting goals where you have a lot of control over them, it's like, okay, well, you know, on my team, I'm going to uh, do X, Y, Z every day. I'm going to try and do code review with my peers. I'm going to do X, Y, Z to contribute to the learning of, of my group. I think those can be really constructive. And you also, every individual has complete control over them. Um, to that point, I think people should create their own goals, like 100% right, you creating goals for an individual, I think is so fundamentally flawed. Yeah. Uh, and it goes against the philosophy you just described, right, is that you're trying to match the specific experience of each individual to their, to their work, right, or, or to, yeah. to, to, to make to it as outcomes. enjoyable as possible, yeah. right. And so, you know, I, I think what I'm trying to say is, I think we agree 100%. We just yeah. describe it in slightly different ways. And I might view goals a little bit differently than you do. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, for me, it's a bit of a thing where, you know, we have this just massive obsession with them. And so my reaction to even cut through that, because if you just have a reasonable opinion on a thing, no one cares. So you have to like go hard the other way to even get people's attention. Um, yeah, but no, I agree with what you're saying. One, one fascinating thing that I learned about, uh, there's a guy named W. Edwards Deming who he's passed at this point. He's sort of a business philosophy guy. Uh, He helped rebuild or build the Japanese automotive industry after World War II, after, you know, it was destroyed. Um, And and he's, you know, largely credited for how the Japanese automakers have conquered the world, sort of. So, in fact, in Japan, there's a thing called the the Deming Prize, which is about uh, efficiency and uh, innovation and all these things. So it's like, he's this like really, really well-known guy, whatever. And one of his things, one of his teachings was that you have to have a systems approach to your business. So you have to think about, you can't have one part of the business do really well and another part suffer. That's not okay. You have to address it like it's all a singular unit and everything. So if you increase sales, right? Like let's say we we double the size of our sales team. Great. Chances are you're going to get more sales if you double, if you put more money and time and effort into it. What are you going to do with customer service? Maybe it doesn't have to grow at the same pace, but if you double the amount of customers you have and you don't invest a dollar in customer service, what's going to happen to those customers? It's not going to be good. So his whole thing is like, you have to have a systems thinking approach. And as such, designing a system for maximum efficiency and output is the key goal, is the key approach. And so in this studying that they did, and this was all based on you know 50s, 60s, 70s work that he had worked with all these companies um, they found, and, and you can fact check this, I might be off by a little bit, but it, it was that a, a, an, an, individual, sorry, an, individual, an individual employee is accountable for 6% of the output of their function, meaning 94% of a person's output. If, if you turn the crank X amount of times, 94% of that was not your individual doing. So they have this philosophy of like individual goals are kind of now, what you're talking about are not like goals in the traditional sense of like, hey, read books, go give speeches, like self-improvement goals. It's more like make widgets goals. He said, you know, you can't hold people accountable to them because they fundamentally are not responsible for in, in any significant way for the outcome of itself. Imagine if you are on a manufacturing line and the line stops, but your job is to make make, you know, parts. Well, the line has stopped. Somebody else up there stopped it. Well, I have no control over my situation. So it's one of those things where I think different roles and different functions and, you know, the world's obviously evolved a lot since he was, you know, studying this stuff. But I think that there is a healthy discussion or, or thought experiment about how much is an individual person's contribution actually attributable to the outcome. Because I think it's a it, it's it's you know if you make sandwiches for a living and no one comes in to make to buy sandwiches, and your goal was based on the number of sandwiches you made, it's hard to hit that goal, right? What are you gonna do? So there there is something there about how the system is designed for people to achieve these things, and if you set up goals there, people are gonna. I mean, look at what happened to Wells Fargo with opening accounts. That is a classic example. You set goals for people to hit to get bonuses for how many accounts you open, and guess what? They start fraudulently opening accounts for everybody and everybody's cheering and happy and giving each other bonuses. Meanwhile, it's, it's all, it's all Fugazi. It's all nonsense. It doesn't exist. So is a real, I think it's just a real problem. And so I rail against it hard just to hope that we find some middle ground there uh, between where we're at in most places. Whereas I think what would be most effective. This episode of Ken's nearest neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that the Z line can come standard with Linux and they also can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right into the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. I love what you said about essentially things derailing if people don't have control over the outcomes, right? I think for me that if you are going to set goals, the most important thing is having things that you have complete control over. Uh, sure. that, you know, one, of, one of my favorite books is called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And they describe like any way to hit a larger company goal 
or is by having people meet the goals that they've set for themselves that they have complete control over. So your mm -hmm. sandwich example, I love that one because it's like, they have no control over how many people come in, right? If, right. I mean, they could influence it, but they could not control it, right? Right. A good goal in that circumstance would be for every customer that did come in, if they, you know, made sure they greeted them with a smile, if they did X, Y, Z in their process, if they were able to like, um, you know, uh, like get, put their best foot forward in some quantified way. Super I think that, that, me. You know, know, ask for an upgrade. Do you want avocado on that? Whatever. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I, I think that those can be effective, but they can have those runaway consequences like you described. Like, you know, maybe it's not a company issue that you're supersizing everything, but you're like, wow, everyone's fat now. So. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and so, so that's my point with this whole, this whole, my whole position on it is like, it is so much what you hear online and read and books and all this is like this, uh, what I would say, like, like fetishizing goals to the point of like, yes, that's how you succeed. And I just disagree with that entirely. You know what I mean? I think they can be useful and effective, but you have to do it right. And I've literally never been anywhere. Actually, no, I take it back. When I was a plural site, we we did it in a better way, but I also was the one that designed that better way. So I'm biased towards how I feel about those ones. So what is the opposite of a goal then? Like what is the, the like direction. the con the so direction versus goal? And what what differentiates direction versus goal? Well, a goal has an endpoint and a direction is just what you know the the thing you're doing progress towards in in a certain path so for example if you are selling uh you know like we were software subscriptions essentially you know we can look at like how many sales you made but we also on the other side could look at how many people were repeat buyers and how long those people were with us and if they referred people right so it's a more comprehensive thing of like how are you treating customers how are you actually building the business because if your only your only focus is you know get number of x number of people signed up you are going to like you know uh, uh, lie cheat and steal to achieve that goal so that way you as an individual can get some kind of bonus or some kind of thing so for example at plural site and i have no idea how it is now but when i was there in the very early days like it's we were like 50 people when I joined. Um, we, we like salespeople did not have commissions. There was no such thing as commission on sales. And, and the reason was basically this whole idea of like, no, let's pay salespeople what they should get paid. And as a result, they will treat our customers better because they're not just trying to, you know, squeeze every nickel and dime out of them. What they're trying to do is make sure that that person is taken care of. And if you've worked in sales and you know sales, you know that sales is a business of relationships. It's not a transactional type job. It is all about helping people and being there for them because situations arise potentially years later where you land a massive deal because this person has trusted you and you've been there for that whole time. But like, how do you measure trust among customers? Surveys? I mean, you're a data scientist. I mean, let's talk about the validity of customer opinions. And you know what I mean? It's just not a thing. So, so like when I was there, salespeople, for example, did not have commission structures. And there's a whole lot of research on, on this and whether or not those are good or bad. And, and I, like I said, I don't know, I've been gone from there for many years now, but that was just an example of like how we would think differently about these things. So that way we would do what we felt was better for the whole company, um, which was, you know, have these longstanding relationships instead of these more transactional ones. I really like that. I mean, it's sort of, it's weird that I remember this concept, but uh, the idea, I think it's something, it's called a B Corp. Are you familiar with that? Uh -huh. Yeah. And so rather than having just a profit motivation, B corporations are supposed to have like a social good and yeah. a couple, it's called a triple bottom line. So they're evaluated not just on profit, but it's significantly more complex. Um, and they're trying to do good across a, a range of things. And I think that that's, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that's something at a high level you're describing is that goals can oversimplify things and create negative, negative externalities. Uh, like maybe mission might be better. Maybe yeah. Uh, for some reason, I don't like love the, the, the just like di direction description. Sure. But I think, I think the idea that it's just so much more complex than what a lot of business books or a lot of people make it out to be is something that's really rich and, and is, has a lot of things like, you know, if, if, if your goal, I, I tell people this all the time, like a lot of people are like, Oh, my goal is to get a data science job. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's a good goal because 
as you described, after you get the job, you might hate it. You might what be like, wow, it, yeah. I worked all this hard. And, and, you know, yes, I get this income, but I hate going into work every day. I mean, in my mind, it's still a goal, but it would be to say, hey, like, I want to create a career that I, that I love. That is my goal. And right. like part of that could be landing a job as a data scientist, but there's so much for, further, uh, further ahead. I mean, I think if you're setting goals with like a, I, I know exactly how I would describe it. I love the idea that um, that you have like a, a path, right? A destin, not a destination, but like an open ended. Mm-hmm. I guess direction going, is we're the right going word that in way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're and, going and, this direction. Yeah, and my philosophy is that you can set good goals to help you get to that long thing. But if the goal is the destination, you're absolutely screwed because once you get there, you're done, and the incentives yeah. are going to be completely so, misaligned. One of my favorite authors in the space is Simon Sinek, and he has a lot of great books. If you guys never heard of him, but um, the the latest one I believe that I've read is called uh, the, the Infinite Game, and it talks about companies that that play in you know in, in in their 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 approach to business and competition and stuff. You have different types of players. You have finite players and and uh, infinite players, and in in a finite game, the go- the the goal is to win. Right. Think of like a football game. You, you, you win or you lose at the end of the day. Right. But an infinite player wants to remain in the game. And one of the great examples he uses was the iPod versus the Microsoft Zoom. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but the iPod came out and then Microsoft was like, oh, crap, what do we do? And so they made the Zoom, which was an MP3 player at the time. And objectively, the Zoom was better by far. It was better in almost every way. Apple did not care at all because see, Microsoft was out to sell more Zunes than iPods. Apple was out to change the world with their technology. And so just as Microsoft has the Zoom and it's coming out and it's starting to build steam, there's people with tattoos on it. You can go Google (laughs) with tattoos of the Zoom logo. Uh, Yeah, bad choices. Microsoft was playing to beat the iPod. Just as they're getting ready to do that, Apple unveils the iPhone and the iPhone. So Apple was playing an infinite game. Microsoft was not. Microsoft lost. The Zunes canceled everything. People are fired, whatever. It was a ter- it was a disaster. So you can think of a lot of these goals in that way, because some of them, like you said, I, I, I don't call them goals. I call them milestones. You know, those milestones, those check marks, I, you know, quarterly reports, all these things are fine. Those are just like reporting what's going on. But if, you're, if your obsession is with achieving a thing by then, you're going to find yourself as a finite player and in, in an infinite game. And I think that's how you lose. I mean, look at, you know, quick aside about sports. It's kind of nuts. But if you listen to Michael Phelps on Tony Robbins podcast, he talked about like having deep depression and suicidal thoughts after winning eight gold medals. Because what's left? You are now the most medaled Olympian in all time. There is no, there is arguably never been a better swimmer on this planet ever. What's next for you? What's next? By the time the next Olympics roll around, you'll be a lot older. The guys will be faster. What, like, so he fell into this deep depression. He had suicidal thoughts. Sean White was on the same podcast. They're talking with him about it. I think it has to do with an obsession of goals because once you achieve a goal like that, a finite goal, winning the Super Bowl, you know, getting a gold medal, whatever it is, what's left? It's a great sense of despair. Just like you're saying with the data science career, if your job is to get that job, great. Now what? Now what do I do? Where do I go from here? It's so so. Yeah, like we we should be thinking like infinite players here because the goal is to is to stay in the game, not to achieve the thing. I have to read that book. I, I read another book called Finite and Infinite Games. I imagine it touches on is it, some of the similar things. Is that a very uh, old book? A very very old book. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that I'm is sure. the foundation for the, for his book. Awesome. And he, he credits it and talks it. That's John something, right? I forget. Yeah, but he I'm talks the about worst that book. Ever with author names. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I, I'm gonna I definitely want to refresh because the, the older book is very academic sounding. Mm-hmm. And uh I don't necessarily do too great with the, the academic literature. No, so and, and Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek is is probably my favorite kind of business philosopher out there, and it's just fantastic. Uh all these thoughts, I mean, they all ring true, not just for me being a fan of it, but like somebody that lived it for how long, how long was I in corporate America? 98 to 2016. Yeah. So 18 years. Yeah. 
before I just said and enough of that. Well, let's talk about what happens after enough of that. So I yeah. know that you have been involved in data education. You also have an incredible YouTube presence talking about electric vehicles. How did all those, what, what's the origin story behind, behind those? And, and you know, what's, what has been the next step of your career after 2016? Yeah. So 2016 was when I officially left Pluralsight, I, April 1st, ironically, which is kind of funny. Um, but before I joined Pluralsight, I had been doing a, a lot of in, individual contributor stuff. I worked at Facebook. I worked at Mozilla, a lot of big tech companies doing really cool stuff. I remember like at Mozilla, we were launching Firefox OS, which was like a mobile OS uh, that was all open source and everything, you know, based on their principles and all that. And we were launching it in all these like, um, like, uh, like Latin American countries and in other places where like the iPhone is like stupid, expensive, nobody owns it because it's just like three months salary to own one kind of a thing. Um, and so, so we were launching this there and I was doing all the, the data and analytics for it. It was a really cool time because I mean, I was working with like our data warehouse was relatively small compared to Facebook's, but it was like six to 10 petabytes worth of data that I was, that I was working with. So, and, and we're talking hundreds of millions of users around the world. Like this is fascinating stuff. Like as a researcher, as someone that's just interested in stuff and in Mozilla is a fantastic organization. I love being a part of it. So I was there and then a friend of mine um, who, who became a customer of Pluralsight as uh, for software development courses said, Hey, they don't have any data courses at all. You should just start teaching data courses at Pluralsight and see what's up. And I was like, all right, well, I don't know. So, cause I'd been doing like in-person trainings and stuff like that for companies I'd been at. And I was a uh, consulting for Tableau uh, prior to that, where I was doing Tableau trainings um, on their behalf and stuff. So, you know, I'd kind of been a trainer educator uh, for, for a long time. And then, so I started talking to Pluralsight and I became an author for them making online courses on, on data stuff, on all kinds of different things. You know, what is big data to data analytics and data science and all this stuff. Started making courses for Pluralsight, met uh, Aaron Sconner, the founder. We became fast friends, really, you know, had, had a bromance there at, at, at one of these offsites. It was a really good time. Uh, just a great guy. And we really hit it off. And he, he was really hot on me coming to work for them. And I just, I told him, no, it was like, I, dude, I'm working in Silicon Valley on protecting the internet from big corporations as we saw it at Mozilla. Um, you know, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, like trying to fight against what they do. And, and, and I'm like, I have the most interesting data in the world. I have all this autonomy. I do all this great research. It's so fascinating. I get paid really well. The benefits are stupid. Uh, like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to come work for a startup out of Utah. It's just not going to happen. Um, and so he came back to me and he said, okay, well, what would be interesting? He's like, he's like, I, I, I want our company to become data driven. I don't know how to get there. Let, let's talk about it. And I said, okay, so let's let's do this. And I came back a couple of weeks later with a plan, a whole business plan essentially, to make to build the data wing of the company, uh, to make the company data driven. And and he loved it. We went back and forth on it. I presented it to the board, and then they hired me as the VP of data to build a data team, uh, three data teams actually, different uh, levels of the organization out here in San Diego where I am. I quickly got to work on that. Fast forward a few years the company grew a hundred X, you know, I forget. We were like, I don't know, maybe we were like, we were making a lot of money when I started, but then we were making 50 X that two years later, three years later. Uh, so we were like a unicorn, you know, we got all this funding and all these things. And, and the company just became, like you said, once you get to a certain scale, it's just a different, different animal altogether. And my, my job was just not something I, I'm, I'm not good at big companies. I just realized that, you know? And so I hit a point where I'm like, look, I, it's time for me to go but I still wanted to keep making courses for them. So I left officially as a full-time employee, but I kept making online courses for Pluralsight. That lasted for another year or so. Uh, and then LinkedIn Learning approached me and Pluralsight had kind of slowed down on the data content that they wanted. So, and LinkedIn Learning came in and were like, no, like uh, we want every data course you can, every, any idea you have, let's make a course on it and just go. And so LinkedIn Learning came in and we're like, yes, do, you know, do that. Um, and so, you know, after from 2016, when I left to maybe the end of 2017, so a year and a half later, a year and three quarters later, I probably put out 20 new courses uh, on LinkedIn Learning and Pluralsight, just like tons of content. I mean, it was my full time job at that point. Throughout that process, we had bought a Tesla and I had sold my wife on the idea that I would that we would save money by owning it. You know, it's cheaper to own, operate, well, whatever, fuel, all this. You know, I, I had 
basically been fed that line, but I hadn't actually researched it myself. She said, yes, we had a young kid at the time. So I was like, okay, you can't drive that old beat up truck anymore. You need a real car. Uh, and so we got, we got a Tesla a year later, I did a video about owning that Tesla and saving money. And it just went absolutely nuts on YouTube. I think I had 800 subscribers and it, the video within the first week had 200,000 views. And I was just like, oh my God, this is nuts. And being a good data guy, I'm like, well, you know, what do you do when you see a signal? You, you do try to do that more, right? That worked. Let's try that again. And so I did another Tesla video and another Tesla video. And it was just like Barry Bonds on steroids, just home run after home run after home run. I legit thought after like two months of doing YouTube that, well, in three months, I should be getting five to 7 million views a month because every video gets four or 500,000 views. Obviously, it's just how they do. Uh, you know, I had a lot to learn, but that was like the dawn of YouTube. Um, and it all came from me already being sort of a content creator, not really like in the YouTube sense, but making online courses for like my first online course I published with Plural Set was in 2013, you know? So by the time I got to YouTube, I had, I had already been making online, making content for a living for five, six years. Oh, that's awesome. I, you know, I, I think it's so cool to see sort of pet projects, things that you're interesting, get legs and, and eventually yeah. lead to income and, and, you know, like financial benefit. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite. It's a whole about. business now. Right? I, yeah. I'm like officially a car journalist somehow. I mean, and I say that just as a way to explain it to people, not as a, a, an insult to actual journalists, because <laughs> whatever I do is not that, but people understand that when you say that word, kind of like if I call myself a data scientist, it's, it's a matter of, ex, uh, of ex, using a term that someone might be familiar with to give them a clue about what I actually do. I'm not a data scientist in the traditional sense at all, but to like the lay person that has no idea the difference. Yeah. I'm a data scientist. Fine. You know, so well, I call I, myself I an auto the, journalist in the same vein. The quality of your work is significantly higher than a lot of the, the journalists that I've seen out there. So I, I don't I know what you're, what you're talking about on that front, but <laughs> you know, so, so you, you really like working on a lot of projects. It seems like you have a lot of freedom to do that now. What are some of the projects you're working on? What are you most passionate about it at this period of time? And what can people kind of expect from you in the, in the future on that front? Well, you know, the YouTube channel focusing on sustainability and EVs, I, I've had, it's been a, an, an interesting ride with a lot of, you know, boat rocking back and forth as to what I do and what I don't do. But I really settled in on, I review electric cars on YouTube and I have a lot of great relationships with a lot of the automakers. And so I would say, expect a lot of videos about electric cars, a lot, a, a lot of like, you know, analysis of them, as well as just opinions of them. You know, I started my YouTube channel looking at Tesla as a data guy. Every video had charts and graphs and I was analyzing the data about Tesla. And that was a unique perspective. And I think that's why it went well. But as I got more and more into cars, I realized that cars are very difficult things to quantify. You, 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 can, you can tell someone the wheelbase of a car or the zero to 60 or the horsepower or this and that, you know, but there's something to be said about when you get in the car, the feeling that it, that it gives you, or when you look at it, you know, cars are more, there, there's more soul to them than there are specs. And so I kind of, you know, I still include a lot of that, but I, I, I just, I try to review electric cars now from a total consumer standpoint of just, I'm a dad with two kids in San Diego or Southern California. What's life like in this vehicle? What's it really like? So I've got a bunch of that coming. Um, I do have my podcast, as you mentioned, Free the Data podcast, where I interview uh, folks like yourself and others in the data space. I don't pretend to teach data stuff directly anymore. I like to just get people on that are much smarter than me and learn from them. And hopefully through that process, other people can learn from them as well. So, so that's out there. Um, I do have a data academy and I have a team that is building our own online courses um, that are all very like short. It's kind of a funny thing about short versus long form content. You know, there's like, in the in the the public world of like TikTok versus say a twenty minute YouTube video, you know TikTok is clearly winning right now th this battle of this like short form video content. And in the online education space, it's always been longer was better. But I feel like a lot of times when that's your incentive is just to have more watch time. It's kind of like it's having a goal. It's 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 now you have people dragging things out and adding filler stories for no reason other than getting you to watch longer this course on Python programming or something. So 
I'm, I'm trying to, you know, go against that a little bit and, and build these like shorter tutorial type courses as well. Um, and it's, it's not even me. It's like, I might be the guy on camera, but I have a team of actual practitioners that know this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, but aren't maybe good presenters and then I'll make a course on it. So I've got online courses coming out. I've got the podcast. I've got, um, I've got the YouTube channel. And then one day I'll have a golf app. I swear. Uh, my goal still, I, cause I have a golf YouTube channel where I, where I do these like driving tours or sort of, I, I put a GoPro on my golf cart and my golf bag as I go play a really beautiful course. And if that becomes monetized, everything else will immediately be canceled because my job then will just be to go play golf. And that is really all I want in life. That doesn't sound bad. Get paid to do the things you love. I mean, you're able to do that with yeah. electric vehicles. Why not? Why not golf in the future? That is so incredible. I, I would probably still review electric cars because, yeah, it's just so fun. I mean, I get to go drive brand new, amazing vehicles on racetracks, go on off-roading trips. I mean, it's just, just it's a very I've never had a job that that's that's that cool other than like. I was the coach at a skateboard camp when I was 17 years old as well over a summer. That was probably more fun because I just got to skate all day. But other than that, you know, yeah, it's, it's hard to beat. <laughs> well, so, so you, you'd mentioned with the free, the data podcast, it had a pretty interesting origin story for the name. I'd yeah. like to think the Ken's nearest neighbors podcast also had an interesting origin story. I, I just outsourced the name. I did a, yeah. a, a you named the podcast type of thing, but I'd love to hear that on the, on the way out here. Okay, so um, oh, what is the band? Free your mind, and the, it's like a, it's like a '90s pop uh, band. Oh man, I can't I can't remember the name of it right now. But uh, my wife and I were in uh, Nicaragua on a what they called surf and yoga retreat. But let's just be clear: if you do two hours of yoga a day and you surf once across five days, you shouldn't put surf as the first name in the surf and yoga retreat. Just saying, right? Anyways. <laughs> We we're on a surf and yoga retreat and they had these, uh, it was a great time. Don't, you don't, don't, don't get me wrong, but I expected more surfing. Um, they had these shirts that said, free your hips and your mind will follow. And I was like, oh, that's genius. And, and I just translated that to free the data and your mind will follow. Because the, the thing I learned in my career it, throughout, you know, all everything we've talked about, my, everything I had done was that. It, it, we tend to get stuck in our ruts and our ways of thinking and, and data can come in and kind of mess all that up, right? It can really throw a wrench in like what works, what doesn't. Um, and it's hard to get out of that. It is really hard to change your way of thinking. The older you get, the more experience you have and whatever the thing is, you just know this is what works. I don't care what your data says. And so the slogan was really to, to try to do the opposite. It was to like have the data be the thing that, that you follow, right? So you free the data and then your mind will follow. It was more like once you see the data and, and, and you hear it again and again and again, maybe your mind will start to listen to what the data says. And I just think it's hard to do. I, I think it's really, really hard. Um, but that, that was the origin of the name. It was from this uh, surf and yo or yoga and yoga retreat that my wife and I went on in Nicaragua. Yoga and surf and very small. Yeah, exactly. Uh, fine print. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. What was that Kirby enthusiasm where like David Schwimmer's on there and he like had a cashew and raisins little thing that he was selling and it was like all raisins and like one cashew. He's like, come on, you can't call this cashews and raisins. What are you talking about? That. So <laughs> how can people learn more about you? How can people uh, get in touch with you if that's something you're interested in? Um, I'll link all of your, your YouTube content and your, your LinkedIn in the description, but are there any other places where, um, you're, you're accessible or anything along those lines? Uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. If you search my name on YouTube, you can learn all about electric cars. If you search for free, the data, you can hear the podcast interviews. And we have a, like I said, a website with a bunch of courses on there and stuff like that. Um, also LinkedIn learning, um, is publishing a lot of my stuff still. So if you guys are on LinkedIn learning, you can find me there. Uh, otherwise social media, I'm, I'm not really on, so I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn, I guess I'm on, but like I go on there, but I'm always just don't know why I'm on there. It's kind of a weird thing. I like the LinkedIn learning platform that seems to have good content, but, uh, but yeah, that's it. Search me on YouTube uh, is probably the, the, the main place. Excellent. Thank you so much again for coming on. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Happy to be here, man.